Hello, everyone. Welcome to the British Library South Asia seminar series, which is part of our research and digitization project called Two Centuries of Indian Print. Today, we are very happy to have Dr. Swati Moitro amongst us. She will be speaking on mobile women, four anecdotes about book distribution. Swati is an assistant professor at the Department of English at Gurudash College, University of Calcutta. She has earlier taught at Shivaji College and Miranda House in University of Delhi. Her work focuses on book history and histories of readership. We are also extremely delighted to have Professor Anandita Ghosh as the chair for our event. Anandita Ghosh is a professor of modern Indian history at the University of Manchester. Her work focuses on the social and cultural history of the book and on questions of power, culture, and resistance. Her published works include Power in Print, Behind the Veil, and Claiming the City, Protest, Crime, and Violence in Colonial Calcutta. About the structure of our event today, Swati will be presenting for about 30 to 45 minutes, after which there'll be a short discussion between the speaker and the chair, following which we'll be taking the questions from the audience. In the meantime, while the talk or during the discussion, you would like to put in your questions, please use the Q&A box or the chat box to do so. So without much further ado, I hand it over to Swati to speak on mobile women, four anecdotes about book distribution. Right. Thank you, Priyanka. Uh, thank you so much for uh, to the British Library for your kind invitation, to Professor Kosh for chairing this session, and to Brett, of course, for your support yet again. Um, uh, it's been a little somewhat difficult, and especially I, I know there's a lot of lot of people here from India. So, yeah, it has been a remarkably difficult uh, few weeks for all of us here. And sometimes it does feel as though I should not be uh, as though anything else but staying alive right at the moment and keeping everybody else alive does not make sense. But nonetheless, uh, uh, one must continue with their work. And so here we are. I'll sh uh, start sharing my screen first. Uh, right. Here we go. Uh, I hope it's, this is visible and I'll start talking straight away. Uh, this paper is about the Bukhwalis of colonial Bengal, whose itinerant hawking practices constituted an important aspect of book circulation in Calcutta and beyond, and shaped the reading practices of the women readers of the Bengali Ondur Mohuls, whose access to books was determined by the constraints upon their mobility and their access to finance. I derive the term Bukwali from the writing of Emma Roberts, the Englishwoman whose sketches of colonial Calcutta in the 1830s speak of the male vendors of the book or Bukwalas with considerable warmth. The Bukwalas and Bukwalis find mention in passing in the pioneering scholarship of the Bengali historians of the book, such as Shukumar Shen and Nikhil Shorkar, who wrote under the pen name Sri Pantho, the rich body of contemporary scholarship on the book in Bengal, ranging from the works of Gautam Bhadra to Muntasir Mamun, from Anindita Ghosh to Tapti Roy, from Abhijit Gupta to Borun Kumar Mukhopadhyay, Adrish Bishash to Arnav Shaha, this body of work has pointed time and again to the existence of the itinerant book peddlers as significant agents of circulation in the early days of print. Ulrike Stark, in her work on the Nawal Kishore Press, has called them the South Asian counterpart of the European coal porter. Stitching together anecdotes and scant evidence in the archives, this paper hopes to trace the fleeting footsteps of the itinerant vendors and the bookwalis in particular. Now in the beginning, as I was preparing for this presentation, I turned to colonial era paintings, such as the one that you see in front of you right now. I turned to paintings of the Chitpur Road hoping to catch a glimpse of the mobile men and women of uh, the book trade at the time. Paintings of 19th century Calcutta are valuable resources for our understanding of the colonial city. These paintings drawn from the British Library archives offer glimpses of parts of the so-called native town of Calcutta, the Kacha roads, the wandering cattle and stray dogs that so often draw the attention of the British painters, 
the bazaars, the various landmarks, and of course, the, the one that you see behind you, the Black Pagoda, for instance, and of course, the ordinary nameless citizens in Indian attire. Chitpur, is an, Chitpur Road is an important arterial road that cuts through the heart of the city. It is deemed one of the oldest thoroughfares of the city, dating back to pre-colonial times when it served as a route as a route for pilgrims from Nodia to travel to the Kalighat temple. Chitpur Road is an important fixture in British paintings, in particular the Black Pagoda, again the one that you see. It, it seemed to capture British painters' interest. I turned to these paintings for the simple reason that the Chitpur Goranhata Shobha Bajar area in the colonial city would emerge as the, one of the most significant hubs of print in 19th century Calcutta, with Chitpur Road and adjacent lanes and by lanes serving as an address for many Indian owned printing presses and adjacent businesses. The paintings did not unfortunately offer me a glimpse of the bustling printing presses as I was hoping and the people who made their existence possible. What was even more curious was the relative absence of women beyond the stock image of the woman with her clay pitcher out to collect water on occasion accompanied by children in the paintings, creating an impression of a city whose public spaces are largely devoid of working women. For example, the painting that you see right now, uh, James Bailey Fraser's A View of the Black Pagoda uh, from 1826. Uh, Govindaram Mitra's Kali Temple, the so-called Black Pagoda that was once the tallest building in Calcutta, dominates the backdrop. The busy Chitpur road in the foreground features customary images of cattle, Brahmin priests, mendicants in saffron, and ordinary citizens in native attire. Only one of them, a solitary figure with the child, is a woman. At the distance, one can spot another woman making her way to the temple. Uh, let me turn to the next image. Uh, again, this is also a Fraser piece. It's a view in the bazaar leading to the Chitpur road, also 1826. A few more women make their presence felt. There's an elderly woman with a stick, uh, with a walking stick, one with a clay pitcher that you be quite, quite a image, uh, and two more on the terrace of a building that overlooks the bazaar. The woman with the clay pitcher, in fact, is a stock presence in a lot of British paintings and engravings of Calcutta. Uh, in fact, the ubiquity of the clay pitcher leads one to wonder if women in the streets of Calcutta did indeed move about to gather water at odd hours, often with children in tow, or if it was simply an image popular among British artists of the period. Uh, in the third image, Charles O'Doyle's Hindu Mutt in Chitpur Bazaar, and again, that's the Black Pagoda. Uh, it, familiar images of cattle, Indians in native attire, and the lone woman with the child and the clay pitcher. Another woman can be found standing on the roak, which is the extended veranda of her house. And the final image for the day um, is, uh, this is, this is from William Simpson, uh, called the Chitpur Road. This is a from 1867. It features a bustling bazaar that the painter himself claimed to be a learning experience for Englishmen, because in this bazaar, hundreds of Englishmen have had their first conceptions of Eastern life realized, or more properly falsified face to face with the living facts. There are two women visible again, and they carry clay pictures, and one of them is accompanied by children. Uh, it's not simply the British painters whose images find no space for working women in the city's public spaces and thoroughfares. A classic text such as Kali Prashanna Shingho's Uttam Pachar Noksha, The Wanderings of the Barn Owl, as it translates to, features the catalog of images spanning the city's busy days and nights, punctuated by the sounds of the clock and the cannons at Fort William. The cacophony of voices in Hutom city offer very little space to working women's voices beyond the cursory sounds of the female fishmonger and the flower seller's sales speech, do you want belly flowers, belly full nebe go, directed at fashionable young men about town. Khamta dancers and baiwalis or courtesans make their presence felt in, felt in more scandalous episodes about the entertainment practices of the male elite. And yet, as Shuvanta Banerjee has pointed out in a 1997 essay, and I, it's a long quotation, I'll not read all of it, but some of it, nonetheless, women of 19th century Bengal, like women in other regions, were not economically or socially a homogeneous group. 
the majority were working women, either self-employed like Naptenis, uh, women from the barber caste who used to decorate with Alta, the feet of Andor Mohul women, sweepers, owners of stalls, filling vegetables or fish, street singers and dancers, maid servants, or women employed by mercantile firms uh, in dealing in seed produce, mustard, lean seed, etc. The poorer class of women used whatever time they had after housework to assist the men in the traditional occupations like cultivation, pottery, spinning, basket making, etc. Because of the nature of their work, these women, women had to move in that dangerous society, which was considered to be a threat to their sheltered sisters who lived in the Ondon Mohuls of the upper class Bengali gentlefolk. For the members of the Zanana, it was often this vast multitude of working women who had access to the Ondur Mahul and so provided the only link to the outside world. This mobility of theirs extended to religious gatherings and festivals, increasingly frowned upon by the colonial administrators and the Bengali elite as hubs of obscenity. Indeed, as Banerjee has cautioned us, when speaking of the reforms for emancipating women in 19th century Bengal, we often tend to ignore the possibility that the issues around which the debates on emancipation revolved might have concerned only the Andur Mahal women of respectable Bodrolok homes who constituted a minority of Bengali women. Now, how are these words of caution relevant to the study of the book in colonial Bengal? Histories of Bengali women in the 19th and the early 20th centuries often preoccupied with histories of the Bengali Bhadra Mohila, which is to say primarily Hindu upper caste women, employ metaphors of cages and shackles to speak of the constraints on women's mobility in the Antupur, as well as the impositions on women's literacy and education. Narratives of emancipation centered around women in the formal education system and emerging women writers and editors harness the language of pioneering and firsts. Now, this preoccupation has extended to book studies. Uh, my doctoral work is no exception, where a significant body of scholarship in Bengali and English has engaged with the female readership that patronized the book trade at the time, with women as consumers and producers of the book. The same cannot be said for the women who were involved in the book trade in a different way, namely the female vendors of the book or the book wallies, as I call them, unnamed in the archives, seldom referred to except in footnotes or passing anecdotes. The book wallies, as I have stated earlier, were important agents of book distribution who formed a vital link between the printing presses and the Antupur of upper caste Bengali households. How then do we grasp the mobile world of the women in book distribution, whose experience in the city was not defined by confinement in the Antupur or by firsts valorized in history, but by survival and occupational pursuits made possible by the transforming economic structures of colonial Calcutta. This paper seeks to consider the same, drawing upon anecdotal sources from the works of Nobin Chandra Shen, uh, Reverend James Long, Shornu Kumari Devi, and Kollani Dotto. Um, we'll come to Nobin Chandra Shen first. Now, this is an off-sited anecdote, uh, a long lengthy one, in fact, I'll try to cut it short. Uh, it's from the first volume of his autobiography, Amar Jibon or My Life. Now, Nobin Chandra Shen, poet and colonial administrator, hailed as the Byron of Bengal by Bokim Chandra Chatterjee, writes, the very roots of this country have been shaken by women's education. Now, such diatribes are not uncommon from the literati of the period. And it is unsurprising that Bengal's Byron shared similar concerns. But his anecdote is a very interesting starting point to the conversation I'm trying to have today about the circulation of the printed book in Bengal. Now, in this anecdote, Sen reflects on an episode which is roughly in the 1870s, where he had returned to his rural home in Noapara, Chittagong, in the monsoon month of Shrabon after 14 long years. The month of Shrabon, is traditionally associated with the worship of the serpent goddess Monosha and rituals that continue to exist till date. Sen, however, experiences a root shock when he finds that the old practice of listening to readings of Monosha Mongol or Monosha Pachali manuscripts read out by the traditional performer, the Kothok, has been in terminal decline in his village. He writes in his aghast, in the past, every respectable household would establish the idol of Monosha in the month of Shrabon, and the entire village echoed with the sounds of Monosha manuscripts being read out loud. And he did uh, announce, he talks about what else was read, uh, the Uchundi Mongol, Ramayana, Mahabharata. 
But now, he says, even if Monusha visits some respectable households, the reading of Monusha and other manuscripts has practically come to an end. I started to look for someone to narrate the Monusha manuscripts. I found out that some of the Kothoks from my childhood, the few who are still alive, are famous readers now, but they have no successors in the village. If you ask them why, they will say, who listens to manuscripts in this country that someone will learn to read them? Women of no household listen to manuscripts anymore. I realized that women's education had indeed shaken the foundations of this country. Novels have taken the place of manuscripts. Sita has been replaced by Shurjamukhi, Ramchandra by Sitaram, Shabitri by Kundanundini, Bipula by Bimala, Sri Krishna by Shottanondo, Urjun by Jibanondo, and he of course holds the Bengali novel and the Department of Education responsible. Now there's a lot to consider here, the most obvious of which is the commentary on women's education and the Bengali novel, characterized here by the works of Bunkim Chandra Chatterjee. Now that has been a subject to considerable scholarly discussion, and for the sake of this paper, I would prefer to set the matter aside with the understanding that Nobin Chandra Shen's anxiety over women's novel reading practices represents, as Anintita Ghosh has called it, the anxiety of the male reformer to whom allowing women to navigate the world of knowledge unchaperoned was tantamount to losing control over their beings. Women had to exist as surrogates in need of continuous supervision to justify the existence of the nationalist patriarchy. Now, such anxieties did not stop feminine consumption of the female uh, of the Bengali novel. Sense anecdote displays considerable surprise over the overwhelming presence of the printed book in a far flung press place in Chittagong, such as his ancestral village, Noapara. Chittagong is nearly 250 kilometers away, I mean, in today's context, from the print hub in Dhaka, close to 500 away, kilometers away from the one in Rongpur, and nearly 550 kilometers away from the colonial capital, Calcutta. The journeys by steamer, often marked by turbulent waters and dangerous cyclones that Sen himself endured on his journeys back home, did not appear to prevent the circulation of the printed book to the distant Noapara, and had even managed to supplant the traditional reading of sacred manuscripts by Kothos. Now, there is a lot more going on here than the simple tale of transition from manuscript to print. The collection of manuscripts as Gautam Bhadra's scholarship on Munshi Abdul Karim and Tapti Roy's work on the print journey of the Onnuda Mongol and Bitta Shundur has shown uh, this, this would become an important consideration for scholars and printers alike. Munshi Abdul Karim's quest to print the most authentic edition of Sayyid Alawal's Paddabuti, after reading a Bottol edition, would lead him down a rabbit hole of manuscript collection, while Ishwar Chandra Vidyashagar's version of the Onnuda Mongol, the print version, would claim authenticity based upon a manuscript shared by none other than the family of the Maharaja of Krishnanagar. However, it was not a simply scholarly collectors of manuscripts, munshis and pundits who facilitated circulation. As Gautam Bhadra has pointed out, we might recall that Horoprasad Shastri, in his bid to write about Bengali publishing, discovered that Pheriwalas, or itinerant hawkers, from the city brought back popular manuscripts from the villages. The same manuscripts were reprinted in the shape of books after some brushing up. This is how the gems of Bengali literature from the Middle Ages was collected. Now, who were these itinerant hawkers, taking it upon themselves to carry popular manuscripts to the printing presses in the city? Were they commissioned by printing press owners to deliver popular manuscripts, or did these hawkers sense an opportunity to do business in the city of print and turn manuscript hunters themselves? If so, how did they convince householders to part with the sacred manuscripts? Such questions might lead us to the second anecdote of this paper, curtsy, Reverend James Long. Um, Reverend James Long's returns to the public relating to the publications in the Bengali language in 1857 uh, is a particularly valuable document for the study of the book and publishing in Bengal in the 19th century. Reverend Long writes about the hawkers, observing that these men may be seen going through the native part of Calcutta and the adjacent towns with a pyramid of books on their heads. They buy the books themselves at a wholesale price and often sell them at a distance at double the price, which brings them uh, probably six or eight rupees monthly. Though we know of one man who realizes by book hawking more than 100 rupees monthly. 
Now, he's full of admiration for the advertising potential of the vendors, arguing that these living agents who show the book itself are the best advertisement for a Bengali book. He's, of course, not the only non-Indian to notice the vendors of the book. Emma Roberts, writing a couple of decades before The Good Reverend, calls them the book hawkers or the book wallas, a sort of literary peddler who wanders about from town to town and station to station with much patience and an apparent love of books and periodicals which such glorious old bookworms such as our Roscoe and Charles Lamb would have greatly admired. Roberts points to the diverse collections of the bookwala, English philosophical treatises, mathematical works, magazines, and offers tales of two amusing encounters with the same. One of them involves an encounter with a turbaned bookwala accompanied by a coolie who offers Roberts a copy of Shakespeare only for it to emerge as an edition of Shakespeare's Hindustani dictionary. Another involves an encounter between a colonel and a Bengali bookwala at Calcutta's Babu's Ghat or Babu Ghat as it is called today, where the bookwala offers the portly colonel an edition of a book titled Weighed on Corpulency, featuring the image of an old fat lady in a chair. Onindita Ghosh cites a letter in The Friend of India dating back to 1822, where the letter writer speaks of no less than four walking booksellers in Murshidabad, one of whom claimed to have earned 30 rupees per month, despite selling great trash, as per the letter writer. Two of the four, we learn, are an employee of a native of Calcutta, and other two are selling for another native who has established a press near Agrudeep, or Ogrudeep as it is called today. Borun Kumar Mukhopadhyay has in fact speculated that the former printer is likely Bhavani Charun Bandupadhyay and the latter Gangar Kishwar Bhattacharya, who shifted his printing business from Calcutta to his village, Bohora. These anecdotes appear to suggest that the itinerant hawkers or the bookwalas facilitated a two-way transaction, carrying manuscripts to the printing presses in the city and ferrying printed books of a wide variety across the city and beyond into the districts. However, as Ulrike Stark has noted with some frustration, little is known about the social identity or the range of activities of the South Asian counterpart of the European Colporter. The aforementioned narratives appear to identify the hawker of books or the bookwala as a distinctly male figure, despite evidence to the contrary. The vernacular literary society, as Stark herself points out, employed several female hawkers who gained direct access to the secluded domestic sphere of respectable Bengali women and reportedly sold books in large numbers. The 1872 census identifies 9,840 adult males involved in the book trade in the Bengal province under the subheading books for the category of arts and manufactures and the sale of manufactured books but it doesn't clar clarify what aspects of the book trade they participated in or any other social indicator. The same census identifies 68 adult females in the Bengal province involved in the book trade. Would the bookwalas or the bookwalis be a part of this categorization by the census takers? Or would they be among those identified underneath other professions, such as the 1,178 adult female hawkers and peddlers? Could the book qualities be found among the 111 adult female gardeners or the 4,793 adult female barbers? The 1881 census makes further division among workers in books in the Bengal province by dividing them into booksellers, bookbinders, printers, newspaper proprietors, and librarian, and places 24,418 adult male hawkers and peddlers separately without offering any information on female workers either in books or in hawkers and peddlers for the, for, for the same period. So the limits of the archives take us back to the anecdotes again, this time from Bordomila consumers and producers of the book. Uh, a third anecdote, I promised four, though I kind of also spoke of about Emma Roberts, but nonetheless, a third anecdote is drawn from the writing of Shornukumari Devi, the eldest sister of Rabindranath Tagore, and an author and editor of considerable significance in 19th century Bengal. She speaks of the practices of reading and writing in the Ondur Mahal of the Tagore household of Jorashako in the earlier half of the 19th century as narrated by her elders, as well as her own experiences. And so she says that reading and writing was an everyday affair in our Ondupur at the time, in the same way as eating, resting and worship was. 
just as the goylani or the milkmaid arrived every day with her milk the malini the gardener or the flower seller supplied flowers the astrologer showed up with almanacs and manuscripts to speak of good and evil so did the white clad pious and fair vaishnavi make her way to the antapur to distribute the light of edu- knowledge now shorna kumari who was born in 1855 did not encounter the vaishnavi or take shishubod lessons from her but she did witness the arrival of the bookwali in the ondor mahal she writes i remember how excited the women's quarters would grow on days the malini would show up to peddle books all the new books of bortola novels and poems strange tales that is to say the kissas she would bring them all to the antapur to expand the contents of the libraries of my sisters she offers quite the catalog of books ranging from the bortola editions of the gule bakavali and kissa e chahar darbesh to the onnoda mongol and duti songbad from kamini kumar to roti bilap they had it all our fourth anecdote drawn from the works of kollani dotto narrates encounters with bookpalis bookpalis in the antapur of an elite bhadra household in calcutta at the turn of the century Like Shorno Kumari, there were no white-clad Vaishnavis distributing the light of knowledge to women in the Antapur, but the bookwalis continued to remain of significance in the lives of the women at the Antapur. She narrates the tale of a smiling woman of the barber caste, Napiteni, of a slim figure, who brought along religious chap books such as Madan Mohan, Tarakeshwar Mahato, Lokhir Pachali, priced at two pesos each. that the other women who ferried japanese glassware and porcelain utensils are simply identified as women one of whom dotto claims gave a copy of the chahar darbesh printed in bortola to bordidi her elder sister the woman simply named malini not as a name but an indicator of occupation by shorno kumari devi as onitita ghosh has rightly pointed out must have had a more flexible occupational role despite the word malini translating literally as a female florist gard- gardener or garland maker the occupation suggests a nobushak caste origin that is to say one of the nine shatshudra castes entitled to have shrotriya brahmans as priests and considered jal acharaniya by brahmins water from their hands would be acceptable accepted by brahmins perhaps even fallen brahmins like the Jura, the tagors of jorashako the jorashako tagors as we know as sn mukherji has shown in his work held considerable caste sway as dolopatis or leaders of their dol of which the jorashako tagor dol was a significant one as dijendranath tagor recalls in his memoirs his father devendranath tagor and grandfather darukanath tagor once held considerable power over the shomaj settling caste disputes of various sorts our malini one imagines was the acceptable short, sort of shudra woman to enter the thakur bari's inner courtyard not for her the romantic fate of bunkim chandra chatterjee's blind flower girl rajoni who eventually marries into the wealthy mitro household rajoni as the novel's dialogue makes very clear is of caste hindu origin uh, you know there's a dialogue let me read it out she is the blind flower flower girl says choto ma in a soft voice the flower girl i thought she is the daughter of a bhadra lok why can't a flower girl be a daughter of a bhadra lok the young man who is the eventual love interest Uh, who mistakes rajuni as a girl of a choto lok or low caste origin by her occupation is chastened even as the heroine's caste identity is established as befitting one that will eventually marry into a wealthy kayastho household our nameless malini identified only by her caste occupation cannot have a proper name the way rajuni might have in bukim chandra chatterjee's novel in this she has much in common with the boishnobi thakurani spoken of with immense respect by shorno kumari devi for her poise and learning as well as her command over sanskrit but identified again by her boishnobism shorno kumari's pension for identifying the working women who conducted various businesses with the thakur bari's ondor mahol by their caste occupations malini goylani might suggest that the boishnobi thakurani too was a jati boishnoba a uh, jati boishnob Uh, because as as connell has pointed out uh, jo- joseph tio connell has pointed out many jati boishnavas were uh, employed as domestic servants by high caste families a number of literate jati boishnav women served as tutors in well to do families and some women copied manuscripts as evidenced by the holdings of the asiatic society of bengal 
Por Porna Shengupta's work on the failed model of the Dhaka Normal School in the 1860s has highlighted the perils of the colonial administration attempting to train literate marginal caste women from the Boiragi Boishnab sect as school teachers in a formal setting. Even though colonial administrators found records of such women engaged as tutors in the zenanas of some households. So the occupational possibilities of Jati Boishnab women as tutors for dominant caste women then remained marginal and curtailed. Indeed, the Boishnabi Thakurani of Shornokumari's narrative is one whom she herself had never witnessed, but rather heard of from older women in the household. Rumanto Banerjee has in fact said that uh, apparently by then the Tagore family's male members eager to emancipate their women from the influence of the lascivious stories of Radha and Krishna had barred their doors to the Boishnabite Kathakotha readers. Now there is no evidence, no concrete evidence either way on this matter. But it is perhaps not entirely impossible to speculate that the emergence of women's schools, especially <laughs> especially after the establishment of the Bethune School in 1949 and the, sorry, 1849, and the contemporary respectability politics at the time ensured that such Jati version of women were no longer required in the Ondur Mohuls of the Bengali households of the, of the Badr Lok. But the same does not appear to hold true for the Bukwalis, who, as Toto's anecdotes show, continued to hold some sway with women readers in the Antapur, even at the turn of the century. The aforementioned Napiteni, the woman of the barber caste, much like Malini, is the member of another Shatshudra caste group. Women from Shatshudra caste groups could very well have found flexible occupational roles that included becoming walking agents for books, their access to inner courtyards of caste Hindu households, placing them in a position of advantage over other caste groups that would not have had the same. As Gautam Bhadra has observed, people from many castes and religions were involved in processes of various processes of book production in the 19th century. No one was left behind. Be it Deva or Asura, everyone's participation was needed to raise the goddess of wealth by churning the oceans of Calcutta, the city of Lakshmi. Of course, not everyone had the same claim to the nectar from her Amrit Kumbh. The walking agents of publishers and booksellers vital though they were to the process of book circulation, did not have the same claim to the nectar from Lakshmi's Amrit Kumbh in the city of print. The scant records and testimonials of the time that offer little by the way of proper names places them in the lowest rung of the hierarchy of print. Mere delivery men and women of little import beyond the physical circulation of the book itself. We are left then, and I'm coming to my conclusion now, we are left then with methods more imaginative as we seek to trace the fleeting footsteps of the Bukwalis, the Malini or the Napitini denied proper names in elite anecdotes. Perhaps Shornukumari Devi's Bukwali, the Malini, was married. Her husband employed in the Thakurbari's extensive grounds as a Mali and referred to again without his proper name. Perhaps she is one of the women referred to in the 1872 census as a gardener, engaged in flower selling, carrying garlands and loose flowers for worship into households, selling them in hearts. Perhaps hers is the voice we hear in Hutum Pacha Naksha, calling out bellyful nebe go to the fashionable young men about town, embarking on a night of adventures. Perhaps she is an agent employed by an enterprising publisher at Bortola who has produced an edition of Kisai Chahar Dorbesh in Bengali from the Hindustani versions of the text popularly available at the time. Now the publisher understands all too well the significance of the female readers of the Antupur and the popularity of the Kissa, especially texts like Gule Bokavali, Hatem Tai and Chahar Dorbesh. The Malini might not be a beneficiary of formal education, despite the expansion in women's education at the time. Her literacy, therefore, might be rudimentary at best. She does, however, know enough about the books she sells and the taste of her clientele to diversify her wear between the perennially popular epics and kissas, as well as the modern novels and the more scandalous Gupta Gothas. One imagines her carrying her wear into the inner courtyard of a household, throwing down her wicker basket on the ground and laying the books out for everyone to see. She haggles with a group of excitable customers she knows well. Does she sit and exchange pleasantries, discuss her day and her family with her customers? Does she sell other indulgences, ranging from cosmetics 
to a smuggled book or two that no Bhadra Mohila should be reading? Does she stay around for the reading hearing sessions after lunch, where women listen to the Ramayon being read in rapt attention? Perhaps she takes orders from her readers, promising to bring an edition of Horidashe Gupta Katha surreptitiously alongside the more acceptable copies of the Onnoda Mongol and Shushila Rupokhan. Even as her patrons coo over their newest collections, she slips away with her wicker basket of books, navigating the streets of the city she knows like the back of her hand. That's all I have to say for now. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swati, your, for your fascinating presentation. Am I, am I audible? You're audible, yeah. Okay. Uh, so without wasting much time, I would now like to invite uh, Professor Anindita Ghosh uh, for her comments and for a short discussion with Swati on her paper. Thank you, Priyanka. And thank you, Swati, for that really interesting and very tantalizing paper, if I may say so. You gave us truly just the glimpses and one wants to know so much more about these, uh, these, these women, these hawkers. Um, I'd like to start with uh, just a, you know, kind of moving from the general to the specific, but just the general sense of how uh, you know, prolific that trade was that you're talking about. So you know, th those listening in might get a sense of you know, just how busy that trade was. You know, they, as, as, as Swati, you would know for yourself, you know, they, they, they very much uh, in, in terms of numbers and print runs, you know, they were way beyond what the more elite literary presses of the city were producing. They were, they were very much in demand. They sold like hotcakes. It's not surprising, therefore, that there would be such a, uh, you know, widespread distribution network for these books. Networks, which you are absolutely right to highlight, but which have not been really studied, and we should. And I, I know evidence, as you pointed out, is hard to come by, but that doesn't mean we don't give that we give up. You know, we have to we have to endeavor. There are there are, there are many parts to this. So to begin with, of course, you, one could go to the to the to the printer's uh, house where a lot of these copies would be kept. Um, so, so that was one point uh, where where the sale happened. Then there were these these hawkers that 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 you talk about. Uh, one knows more about male than female hawkers, rightly so. Uh, it was a very profitable trade. Again, as you point out, you know, six to eight rupees a month from just hawking books is is not bad money in 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 those days. They were also long tells us they were they were they were part peasants part hawkers, you know, so, you know, the, the times of the, of the year when the land is lying fallow, they would be uh, very much engaged in the book trade. Um, there was another method through which, of course, we know these books went out, that is through subscription. So people in Mufasil areas could, you know, pay through subscription. And, and that was one, uh, another way of do, doing it. But, but there's like a lot of record to show that wherever hawkers have, were employed, the, the sales really, really went up. So they were an indispensable part of the book trade as much as the printers and publishers and authors were. Yeah? So the 19th century book business could not have happened without these people. So you're absolutely right to, to, to throw the spotlight um, on, on, on these people. Um, and, and I won't be surprised that you don't find them in the in the paintings that you show us, because that that's not something that uh, you know our colonial painters were interested in showing. They were not. They were more interested in the bazaar and the woman with the picture than books. So even if they were blatantly there on the Chitpur roadside, that's not something they would pick up. But also possibly because you know a lot of these bookshops were not really bookshops as we perhaps imagined, with books all stacked up. You know they were probably in a back room somewhere. You come and knock on the door, and uh, the householder or the printer, stroke printer, opens the door and and asks you what book you want, and they go and get it from the back room. So maybe they were not visible in in in, in, in shop fronts in the way as we perhaps uh, expect uh, they they might have been. Um, <clears throat> 
but 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 it it's it's absolutely clear, crystal clear that without these hawkers, these uh, would not have been uh, you know these books wouldn't have reached as far and wide. You know they're everywhere. They as you said, you know they're by the babu cart. Uh, they're on trains. Uh, uh, they they are they are actually carrying them to 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 the villages. They're walking uh, on, on you know they're they're walking. They're on foot. They're everywhere, and and that's how they they reach these these really wide networks. The, the school book society depends on them. I think initially they did not, and then they realized they needed to employ hawkers. And when they did, again you know their books went far and wide. So this this is really really. <clears throat> This is really, really important what, what you, you just now talked about. But let's move on to the specific of uh, specifics of what you are talking about, which is the female hawkers. And, and again, I think you know that 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 is really the tip of the iceberg for, for anecdotes. Because if they were important, these hawkers for the book trade, they were doubly, triply important for our women readers, because that's the only way through which these books would reach them. And this is, these are the earlier generations of uh, literate women who are reading books on such a vast scale. They would, have, they would have heard manuscripts before, they wouldn't have read them. Um, but, uh, but, and even if they would have read them, they, it wouldn't have been you know, widespread practice. But the books, they're easily, they're easily available. They're, you know, they're coming to your home, they're being brought by the Nathani or the uh, Boishnobi or the Malini, and, and, and they're there. And easily, easily, um, you know, coming in from hot from the off the press, and that access would not have been possible without your female um, hawkers. Uh, so, from that point of view, in terms of really expanding women's literary tastes and the kinds of books they read, they played a very, very crucial role, and and it's coming up in you know the memoirs you mentioned. Uh, it's come, and, and these these are highly literate, educated women of the times who who are who remember with pleasure the, these hawkers coming in, you know, sell, selling the Bostola books, um, even though they would have been they would have known what the you know more desirable uh, tastes of the time were. You know, they they remember. There's a fond remembrance. There's a great deal of fondness for these hawkers who might be the same hawker coming into the household year after year, you even have a relation, built up a relationship with them, you know? So, so you know, they're kind of vital cogs in that wheel of distribution and therefore need, needs to be appreciated. Um, the other thing I was really interested in, you know, uh, which never occurred to me when I was doing my research, but now that you mentioned it, the way you, you bring them up, you know, these terms, Malini, Boishnobi and Nakhteli, now, how far are these really generic terms or are these occupational terms? Now, the reason I ask is that, you know, the Malini and the Naftani or the uh, Boishnobi, uh, well, most of the Malini and the Naftani, they are often the literary tropes as well, aren't they? You know, they, they're absolutely, always, absolutely. you know, part of conspiracies. You know, they're, they're the ones who will make lovers meet. They're the ones who will carry messages. They invariably, you know, in part of this, this world of secrecy, this part of you know forbidden things, and and they are invariably your messengers in 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 these situations. So I was quite intrigued listening to you today as to you know what what they really were because you know why would suddenly a Malini be uh, a, a hawker or a Naftani be apart from the fact that of course you know they can also reach the Andar Mahal, which, which, which is possible. But but you know might might that be something else as well? Um, it's it's just a thought, but it it could be occupational, but it might not be. But it's 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 I think it's important to reflect on that to find out you know where you know where 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 that fulcrum really lies. And I don't I don't have an answer to that. I but I just thought you know, maybe you might want to comment on it. And 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 finally uh, about literacy amongst these. Um, Talkers, um, you allude to, I think, once in your paper that they would be little. I mean, you would need to have some kind of functional literacy to be able to say, you know, this is your Gulab Kali or this is your uh, Hatimta. You know, you would, you would have to be uh, able to be literate enough to read that. But how far were their, their own tastes also driving? the peddling of course you know they would they would be very mindful of what the consumers want 
Um, and, you know, they, they might be running errands, as you said, for women, you know, who would give them their orders and they would be uh, getting that next time they come in, they'll be bringing in the books that they want, that these women wanted. But is, is, is it possible that they also would be picking up a few books that have just come, come out and, you know, in turn, then taking them to these women and saying, look, you know, these are new and, you know, just hot, hot off this press. Do you think you might be interested? And if that is the case, then, you know, once again, there is that very hidden layer, that secret layer of, of the role, the tremendous agency played by these women in developing women's tastes in Dondar Mohol. And, and, you know, no wonder people like Nobin Shen are, are cribbing about it because they have no control over that world. And, and this, this the, the, the idea, the whole idea of women bonding in Dondar Mohol, you know, it, ha, it has been written about in scholarship in recent times. And, and it is a very real world out there. You know, these, they're very much on their own. They're not, they're left alone, but, but they're not, left alone, if you know what I mean, you know, they're up to things, they're doing things constantly. So I, I just find it fascinating to even, maybe I'm just jumping ahead and being too, too very imaginative, but it's possible, you know, if you're literate, you're in the book trade, uh, you know, you might have your own suggestions to bring back uh, to your consumers. But, but again, you know, the, these, are, these are thoughts, but as I said, it's a very, very tantalizing paper and it just picked up so many interesting threads that could go further. But uh, I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that. But also, may I say that you've been extremely brave to come and give us this paper in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and, and, you know, with, with what's raging around you, I, can, I can't even imagine what, what you're going through. But, but thank you very much for that. Thank you so much for listening. Um, uh, I'd like to comment especially uh, on your second point, because uh, that's actually something I did think about and I didn't really get to talk about because of course when you're quoting Rajoni you were also thinking of Hira Malini in Bishop Rikho and uh, uh, this is in fact also something I must thank Priyanka for because uh, back in the days when she had been working on her uh, MPhil work she had worked on the farces and again you do see uh, women of uh, particular caste background such as the Malini such as the Napiteni who play a certain uh, a set of stock characters who um, they perform a lot of insignificant roles. They're the ones with the coarse abuses as well, which is, of course, uh, the typical stereotyping of, of the Bengali stage at that point of time. But uh, I think the reason that the Malini or the Napiteni is a trope is precisely because the Malini or the Napiteni has a very significant role in the lives of the women of the Ondur Mohol first and foremost, and of course, not simply as a book trader, but the book trade is part and parcel of it, no doubt. But the Malini and the Napiteni and women of, and I must insist on their caste origin, the Shudra caste, because it is, it, it evidence seems to point to these particular caste groups that had, that would be considered short enough, acceptable enough to be uh, to enter, it, it could not have been, say, a Bauri woman or a Bagdi woman or a woman of these caste origins, right? That That's a distinct narrative altogether. So uh, the Malini and the Napitini are tropes precisely because of the significance that they do hold over the lives of women in the Ondur Mahol, that even if they want to, you know, be it a copy of a, a novel that they want to read or something else, the, it, it's a message that they want to send. It is the mobility of these women that makes possible these things. And that, that's precisely how they become such successful hawkers as well. Uh, the, the last point that you make about their taste striving is again something I had not thought about. But yes, absolutely, that may have been. For instance, as, as you were speaking, though again, this is conjecture on my part now, completely imaginary. Um, uh, as we see, as, as the, you know, as the book trait uh, becomes a thriving, we see, we see the co book covers in particular beginning to take shape, though this is really 20th century more than the 19th century. I wonder if the book covers had some role to play in terms of their appeal to the women delivering these books or to the women buying them. I wonder if they talked about the books if, or if it was the publisher pushing ideas saying, take this to the ladies, they will like it. Or if she also had a certain input 
considering the again considering the street smartness and the business savvy of these women that we do undoubtedly witness perhaps this would very much have been part and parcel of that narrative but we can we at the moment what i have right now is conjecture which is why i said we must resort to more imaginative methods the narratives that i have won't even give them names so yeah. there is that Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swati and Anindita Ji. Um, and the questions have started coming in. Um, there's one question at the moment. But before I take the mention, but I'm sure you're looking into it. Um, in terms of uh, you know the hawker, and I would like to know a little bit whether these texts at all mention women as hawkers. One is uh, a Kolkata Periwala Daka Rasta Rawaj by uh, Radha Pushad Gupta. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one, I don't know if it at all talks about you know, book vendoring. It's um, Monomohan Boshu's diary, uh, because he was the one who was uh, collecting and publishing a lot on different kinds of songs. And he had a lot to say about the genre of the Keud as well when talking about uh, performances like Kobi Gaan and Torja. So um, just wanted to refer to these two if, if you have come across anything in uh, these texts. The former does not, the latter I have not looked at. So I'm going to have to ask you for the full reference later. <laughs> okay, so I won't take more time. So I'll start reading the questions. The first is from Mo Banerjee. Uh, she says, brilliant talk, Swati. I'm wondering about two other groups, one being the Acharjani uh, referred to in the Thakurbari Chronicles, a cross between doctor and storyteller, whose medical advice led to the death of Sharada Didi. What I mean is, in what ways are you uncovering not only women as booksellers, but as professional women outside the Bhadra Mohila in colonial Calcutta? Two, the books being referred to in your anecdotes are respectable books, but women and scandals are ever present in Bortola yellow journalism. Do you find any evidence of trade in illicit books and Gupta Kothais and women both reading and facilitating the trade in such books, as well as the facilitation of the spread of gossip of the Andur Mahal to the Bahir Mahal and to the world of, and to the colonial world? Right. Um, thank you so much, Mo, uh, for the questions. I'm glad you are here. So yes, uh, when I started thinking, to, to, to answer your first question, when I started thinking about this, and I have been well thinking about this for a very long time, five years now to be specific. Uh, so when I first started thinking about it and even writing about it, I was not really thinking of anybody else but the booksellers, precisely because they are so frustratingly everywhere, if you look at the uh, narratives of the time, and yet so little that we know so little about them. But as as I started to work, uh, as I started to work a little bit more about this, it became amply clear that the booksellers were not simply. I mean, they were. It, it's extremely. Un we cannot say for certain. Perhaps the gentleman who sold books worth 30 rupees a month was only a bookseller, but it's extremely unlikely that they would have been solely booksellers, but rather uh, this was something that they probably doubled up as, 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 as another job. The Napitenis and the Malinis whom we encounter in fiction, as well as in the memoirs, also appear to suggest that they did, did have professional lives outside of book hawk, of which book hawking was only a part of. And so that world of professional work is something that needs to be traced and mapped from the, again, I go back to the farces where you have the domestic servant as a particular uh, figure of import, the female domestic servant. You have these figures of the Malinis and the Napitenis, the woman who delivers milk, uh, again, significant, all, all of a particular caste origins as well. So this, this, this is something that remains to be seen and their connections with the book trade. Though, again, evidence is scant. The latter is something that I do have an answer, to, a more concrete answer to, because yes, there is evidence in trade in illicit books and Gupta Gothas, though very interestingly, there is again, this is so characteristic of Bhadra Mohila narratives, is that uh, 
Shornokumari Devi is very clear that these are ashare golpos. So, so the books that the bookseller brings are, well, you know, books of not particular significance. Kollani Dotto mentions that a book like Kashir Kecha, it's a Kecha, uh, Kashir Kecha was in fact brought to the Ondur Mohol. Ranga Didi had a copy of it, but she does not mention who brought it. It's almost she delicately forgets. I don't remember who brought that book. And that is something uh, I think that that little evidence is enough for me, enough to suggest that there was very definitely um, trade in illicit books and that these women were the ones facilitating, facilitating it because it's unlikely that a Ranga Didi or a Boro Didi would be telling uh, the men of the household to get them Horidashe Gupta Katha. It is more likely that it would be sneaked in alongside more respectable books. As far as, as for the facilitation of the spread of gossip, again, we have very little uh, evidence of the, con as, I mean, from what I have studied so far, very li little evidence of the conversations that they had. So we are left with nothing but conjecture at the moment. Though I hope perhaps to have uh, better answers to this in the future. Uh, I hope that's a sufficient answer for you. Okay, uh, the next one is more of a comment from Obhijit Gupto, um, who says, uh, I seem to remember that the founder of uh, PPM's press, predecessor of uh, Devshaita Kutir, Boroda Prashad Majumdar, who lost his uh, Jomidari in a drunken night scarrows, restarted life as a hawker of books in Bortola and saved enough to set up as a publisher on his own. That's a remarkable story. Okay, the next question uh, is from Penelope Hornet. She says, did they just sell books? Was there a market for women's magazines too? Thank you for a most interesting talk. Uh, from what evidence we have, most of the women's magazines were sold by subscription. Um, and there is, uh, because the women's magazines at, in the 19th century were mostly respectable magazines such as the Bhamabudhini Putrika or even Bharati, which was run by, although I would not call Bharati a women's magazine, but Shwannukumari Devi was the editor. These mostly run on a subscription basis. And you, you have list of subscribers at the end of, uh, in the last page of a lot of the magazines of the period. So you can get an understanding of it. Uh, most of the subscribers are in fact male. So it's possible that there are female names, of course, but most of the subscribers are male. And it appears to suggest that male members of the household subscribe to the magazines, which would then be sent by post to these particular households. Women's magazines of the sort that women can buy in, uh, I mean, uh, that, that are perhaps less respectable or uh, that that uh, is not something that we see. But these women did not simply sell books. I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that they did not. I mean, we have at least some evidence. I mean, both their caste occupations appear to suggest they're not given proper names, but their caste occupations appear to suggest that um, they did double up, at least the Malini probably did uh, double up as a flower seller, as well as a bookseller, because why not? Um, you also have evidence of women bringing in a lot of things like Japanese glassware, porcelain, uh, probably counterfeit porcelain, alongside the books, appearing to suggest, again, they're highlighting the nature of the book as a commodity, uh, as a commodity which could be sold alongside things like indulgences such as you know porcelain and Japanese glassware and cosmetics and the like. So yes, they were definitely not or at least from what evidence we have so far, though there could be more, I, I, I do not know yet. Uh, we're not definitely full-time booksellers, so to speak. If I may just come in, I think what, what is critical here, you're absolutely right, Swati, is the access to the to the Ondur Mahal and, and whatever could be peddled via these these women would be done by by you know those those looking to make quick money. So it's it's that access, and as you said, you know, canny booksellers would definitely want to capitalize on, on that kind of access. And on the serial front, I was just thinking, and I saw a comment in the chat about Daruga Doctor. Uh, so not quite women's magazines, but you know, they were serial publications as well. So, you know, stuff like Daruga Doctor might might have gone out, you would think, you know, that a lot of that is about sensational murders and you know, often mm -hmm. to do with romances or you know, scandals in households and 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 so on. Do you do you have 
any, I mean, not, not that I know of, but do you know of any evidence of uh, these going out as serial publications? So I'm thinking of, ma I'm kind of stretching magazine to be read as serial publications. Hmm. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, may, maybe serial publications might have gone out through your, through your hawkers, or do you think that's only subscription? No, it's possible. Right. See, by the turn of the century, again, by 1890s or so, we do have an emergence of the whole crime genre. And uh, by all means, these these were extremely popular among women. So I mean, more the, I mean, from ranging from the Kechas earlier to these now, the Gupta Katha also really takes off at the turn of the century. So it's I I don't think it's a stretch to assume that the hawkers would have been carrying this. Right? I, I think it's a distinct possibility, and especially if the books are something that women shouldn't be seen reading in the first place, then it makes more sense for the hawkers to be delivering them as opposed to ordering them by post or, you know, having a male member go to the printer's shop. I mean, not the bookshop, but, you know, the printer's printing press and obtaining a physical copy, right? Yeah. It, it does appear to suggest so. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Swati. Thanks, Anantadi. Uh, the next question is from... Shobhik Bhattacharya, the Shakshudras does had the freedom to wander out while the upper caste women were in Ontoku. Do you think this was a topic of discussion between the upper caste and Shakshudras? Well, that's something we are left to again imagine. Uh, the women in the Ontoku, I, I don't know how much the divide of caste would have allowed them to consider the possibility of wandering into the dangerous city and allowing ritual pollution the way that a Napiteni or a Malini could have had, right? So this is this is purely conjecture on our part. They may have had. I think, again, uh, we do have evidence of bonds being formed between women of different caste groups while, of course, the boundaries of caste remained. Uh, we do see the bonds uh, of, of between women of these caste groups precisely because of their long association. So there, there is that. But as to whether or not these sort of heart-to-heart -heart conversations would have happened, that I think, again, is a matter of conjecture that I cannot comment on. Okay, the next question is from Farhan Noor. Thank you for that wonderful presentation, Swati. Picking up on the discussion on women hawkers' agency in distribution of books in this context, is there a significance of genre tendencies for very diverse examples like novels on the one hand and books on household management or such instructive pamphlets by any chance? I see almost no evidence. I mean, so far, again, perhaps I should point out that my evidence is so scant that I'm going running on fumes here. But so far, I see no evidence of the uh, book while he's bothering with uh, instruction, instructive manu manuals, which appears to suggest that those were probably brought into the household by the men of the household who hoped that such good books would be read by the women in their, in their lives. Uh, because the genres that they seemed to prefer were very much the novels. The, the kissas in particular are extremely popular. The kissas are stressed upon, in fact. Uh, the novels, the kissas, the Gupta Kothas and the Nash, though they don't really talk about the Gupta Kothas beyond a certain point. And of course, Ramayan, Mahabharata, Annada Mongol, the acceptable sort of, so nobody mentions Vidya Shundar, but Annada uh, Mongol is mentioned. So these seem to be the generic preferences. And I would suspect that uh, later on, Though again, bookstores became become more and more viable. I mean, begin to exist more and more as the 20th century progresses. But I would dare say, given that we have, have evidence of theater pamphlets being distributed by women hired by the theaters to the Ondur Mughals, I would say that even uh, things later on uh, from the uh, I mean, this, uh, this would suggest that this continued to, to be a practice in uh, later on as well. But again, I have very scant evidence here as to how much access women would have had to the bookstores in the uh, 20th century and whether or not the 20th century genres, how they were patronized. That's again something I, I, I can't really say beyond a certain point. I, I can, I, this is the evidence that I have so far. Thanks, Swati. The next question is from Shupunadash Gupto. 
is there any evidence of interaction between bookwalas and bookwalis not that we have here but uh, again it would not be a stretch to imagine that they did because they would be picking up the books from the same place uh, but we we barely have so far from what i have been able to uh, gather we barely have access to the voices of these men and women uh, which means that whether or not and how they interacted with each other is something that i don't really know at the moment but it's of course they interacted they picked up the books from the same place how could they not um the next question is from orpita dash as a small independent publisher who's constantly trying to find more innovative ways of reaching my reader i'm wondering if you can talk a little more about how the publishers of time interfaced with these women did they give them particular instructions or were these women carrying back reader preferences to the publishers now we know how the publishers were interacting with the bookwalas so what i say about the women women is an extension from there uh, we do know that the publishers explicitly hired these walking agents uh, to carry books both in calcutta from places as diverse as babu ghat to the household of emma roberts as she, i mean one book wala entered barged into her house and trying to uh, tried to sell her a copy of shakespeare so we have them in places as diverse as this and her anecdotes in particular are interesting because here you have a bookwala trying to sell an english woman shakespeare that does appear to of course it turns out to be shakespeare's hindi dictionary but the fact that the bookwala is trying to sell shakespeare to an english man and an english woman does appear to suggest that there is some understanding of the reader's tastes the second anecdote that she gives us also which is you have a very portly colonel being given a book called weighed over corpulence with the image of a corpulent lady and the colonel thinks that this may be a joke played by somebody or by the bookwala himself uh so again th these these anecdotes do appear to suggest that they understood to an extent readers needs uh there's also she talks in glowing terms about the fact that they catered to the urges of these uh young hindu and mohammedan men who were trying to educate themselves so they offered a wide variety of books from grammars to magazines to philosophical manuscripts all for the welfare of the young native mind so yes this does appear to suggest that the bookwalas were quite conscious of i mean if if we, you know young men educating themselves for british jobs were probably trying to read uh, uh things that the englishman would approve of and would improve their english skills uh so from it's from there that i offer this conjecture we don't know how the publishers interacted with the bookwalis in particular but even if something as respectable as the vernacular vernacular literature society is engaging them it appears to suggest again that it does the publishers do understand their significance so how did they tell these women that take these books and go try to sell these books these are good books at that at that, that, that uh, again conjecture and again as onnita ghosh pointed out right now did the tastes of the bookwalis drive the sales to an extent that's again something i hadn't even thought about but yes it could have but i, I wish i had more concrete answers for you i don't so <laughs> this is what i have to leave you with thanks swati um your next question is from abhijit gupta have you found any mention of mem sahib selling distributing christian tracts in the antapur janana no uh, and that that is that is perhaps because i was not really uh, paying a lot of attention to the mem sahibs in the first place but that's something uh, the only mem sahib i do hear of is the uh, the one who was asked for the copy of abidda sundar and then handed over shushila rupakhan to her charge instead so apart from that i admit i have these, paid very little they be sold though they would come for free yes that's that's also true that's also true so i haven't paid a lot of attention to the mem sahibs in the first place can, can i can i just just come come in just very briefly uh, <clears throat> 
you know, I was when you were talking about other things that these people peddled, and somehow I'm more attracted now towards the idea of them working as uh, these these hawkers, stroke Malinis uh, or Nafthanis, acting more as networks for all kinds of commodities and not just books. So you know, your even gossip, as Mo pointed out, and, even and gossip. gossip, certainly. Except we don't know whether it went out from the under mall to the outside. That we are not too sure about. But but yeah, surely they must have got city gossip in. Uh, I'm I'm quite sure. But you know, uh, uh, and that's a really really attractive idea at the moment that that you you floated. And I think I want to hold on to that. But also these publishers were very canny. They were giving out often images. Well, I mean not images, pictures like posters to hang up on your bedroom walls, weren't they? So. The, that that was also possibly another point at which your you know particularly the women might have had a greater role to play. So you know they might have picked up certain images or books that came with free images because that's what the women wanted. So sometimes it might have been the the value of the image rather than the book, the free images that you're getting, rather than the book that that is uh, driving them to to pick them up. So you know we are we are really looking at. You know, kind of the 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 the, the uh, very hyperactive world of 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 businessmen and women who 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 are not interested in literacy, not interested in creating literary tastes. You know, that goes out of the window. It's like what sells? What do people want? They're constantly trying to get a a, a sense of that of the tastes of these people, whether it be your your vases or whether it be your your images or books. Uh, and 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 that's what makes them such successful businessmen. So you're on to something, Swati, for sure. Material culture, I think, you know, kind of the gen general material culture that that that's that that's being um, peddled through the to these women. Uh, fantastic. Thank you. I also think they would have been certainly selling. I was just uh, about the the Bashar uh, Bashar Ghosh songs and all of that. They certainly Ooh. have been selling all of them, for sure. Ooh. The ones that you've written about, yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah. certainly. Yeah, yeah. Shati, I think there was one question from Mo, which uh, Anmitadi has already preempted, but I will read it out in case you want to respond. Yeah. Uh, she's saying, um, wondering if Daruga Doctor might have more leads for you in terms of women as itinerant mm -hmm. book peddlers. I also mm -hmm. wonder if Malini and Naptini are derived from uh, marital uh, associations. Yes, absolutely. I, I do think so as well. I mean, it, it's entirely possible that their husbands, I mean, I, as I also speculate, because I have no evidence, I speculate, for all we know, the Malini who brought books into the Thakurbari was very likely her husband would have also been employed in the extensive Thakurbari grounds. And neither of them would have been granted proper names in the memoirs of the Thakurbari. So yes, certainly so, certainly so. Um, Shati, I was thinking of two other spaces which could probably have been spaces where women uh, that women were venturing into as hawkers. And one is the religious site. And this is from an example which is much later, I mean, which um, I, I have uh, written about a little bit. It's uh, the performer Romeshil, the Kobial Romeshil in Chittagong. Uh, he talks about this, uh, he was into the Majbhandari uh, Torika, and uh, he talks about this religious site of Gautalazam, uh, where he first came across song collections being distributed by young boys. So uh, um, just to think about religious sites, which were also mm. performance sites, um, mm. as potential areas where, you know, this literature would be, uh, you know, distributed, sold. Yes. And the other is... Uh, fairs, the space of the mala, absolutely, uh, which absolutely. would, you know, be, a, again, a potential space for we, men. We getting. actually do have evidence of male booksellers in heart, heart and mala. So there's certainly that. But uh, the question of women venturing into these spaces is something to think about. I think there are no more questions. So in case you want to, you know, say something else or, you know, have other comments on Inditadi, would you like to I say was something? I just going to say, where are you going to go from here, from, from this paper? Are you, are you going to build on this? What are your plans? 
I do hope to build a little bit more on it because again, it's very frustrating to uh, be, to have to resort to, I, I don't mind resorting to imaginative means. I read a lot of Saidiya Hartman before this, just to brace myself for the fact that I may not be able to, after a certain point, uh, find the voices of these women themselves. But I do think, I, I hope to at least uh, establish this work a little to an extent where uh, we can start talking about the vendors, the, yeah. the periwalas, and, and the women in particular as important agents of book trade. Because uh, we, do, we do need to, I mean, just as we talk about the compositors and the printers and the other figures of the book trade, uh, these were important figures. And uh, I do think at least we can start the conversation about the people who made the book trade possible instead of circulation in purely abstract or numerical terms. Mm -hmm. So there is that. And the rest uh, remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's there's so little to be. Absolutely, absolutely right in, in, in what you said that you know, we, one, one needs to get at these networks, particularly I think where women readers are concerned, you, you, you wouldn't really have that readership is built up on, 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 the, on the backs of that hard labor. Hmm. Of, of these peddlers going in and, and expanding the taste. So, you know, not just uh, uh, keeping to Shushi 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 La Upakhan, but actually, you know, taking it beyond that and, and giving them that wider world of hmm. books that, that they could. Because uh, I think my to. own work and, has and had been. As they wished, sorry. Uh, no, as in my own work had been so frustrating earlier because precisely even as we're working on the women readers and the Ondur Mahol, and their lives are no doubt fascinating. but. I was, I myself was talking about them in terms of the firsts and the pioneers and well, you have a wide, uh, you, you just have to decenter the lens from the on the mahal a little bit because you mm. have a large number of women living lives, professional lives, working lives that are distinctly different, yeah. right? And, and it doesn't make sense, especially for something like the book trade to not center these women Absolutely. even if we have so little to go by. Absolutely. I wonder whether you should be looking at perhaps more unconventional sources, like say, you know, embroidery, for instance, you know, uh, it, it, katha scenes hmm. would often depict very household scenes. And, and it's not particularly meant for, you know, any wider consumption beyond that of the household, or maybe just that very bedroom where it belongs. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. You know, thereby saying you know it's very easy to get. But uh, all I'm saying is you probably have to be a bit more in, inventive in the in in you know what sources you go to and, and what things you look into. Um, pot painting would not clearly have. It wouldn't be a source for you. But but maybe katha, which is far more domestic. And yes, I've, I've on and off I've come across references to to not your booksellers. But uh, those kind of uh, painting very intimate domestic uh, scenes, kind of familial, not intimate in any other sense, but very familial. So maybe, maybe you will find your uh, your hawker there, which which is still not concrete, but would add another layer of yes. that that intimacy of that female space uh, where the bookseller and the reader is bonding over books. That's, that's certainly something worth looking at. And there's a lot of it in the Guru Shodha Museum and it's possible mm. to visit again. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Thank you. So I don't think there are any more questions. So there might be one more. Um, I think they, uh, all yeah. they, would have, uh, they would have had street cries. Uh, though what they were, we, we, that's not really noted down. Also, uh, given that these women, at least some of them were selling books alongside other things, they would have probably had street cries that, uh, that mentioned all these things. But what that is, uh, Priyanka referred to a very comprehensive collection of uh, uh, street cries a little later in history, but we, we find no mention of the bookwalis there, possibly because by that time, the need for such bookwalas or bookwalis had ended. So yeah, I, I, we can only have conjectures about this, but they would certainly have had. Um, yes, and you, you did mention Hutum during your talk and uh, mm. 
it's quite glaring that there is no mention of no, uh, none. Uh, the hawkers. Where, I mean, uh, the voices that we hear are uh, fishmongers and, you know, um, flower sellers. And those are probably the only women who have been depicted in the and text. That's in, uh, in the margins, isn't it pretty curious that Hutum, who has so much space for professional men in the city, those, those fantastic sketches, almost zero for the professional women beyond the Bayawalis and the Kamtawalis in a very scandalous context. And um, just to stretch what you've been speaking about, you know, about uh, book distribution and selling, I was also thinking more in terms of the work that Onizdadi is now doing um, on um, revolutionaries, violence and popular patriotism. Uh, you know, thinking about women as, you know, smug smuggling these proscribed absolutely, literature. Absolutely. And uh, that's their a role whole in new, that. That's a whole new thing. Women's uh, smuggling letters being sneaked around. That's, that's a whole new world altogether. But you know, funny onwards. enough, the world of literature and revolution comes together. And um, I've, I've not done a great deal of, of work on this yet, but uh, the more you read uh, the, these memoirs and autobiographies of these revolutionary women, what are they inspired by? Pothe hmm. Isn't that fascinating? Yes, so it, absolutely. <laughs> it's not just what's happening around them, but it's also what they're reading. Yeah. But at least two of the women I know of, in the very well known ones, have been reading Pothe Dabi. Absolutely, absolutely. That's it's amazing. Just, no, once you get to the 1920s and 30s and you have the women of Bethune's College getting mm. together, getting the act together, it, it becomes a different story altogether. Absolutely. Absolutely. A fascinating one, of course. I think there's one um, question, comment from Mo. Um, yes. Also the question no, of what we see and hear and what we filter out, Hutum wouldn't need to hear the cries of professional Oh yeah, um, and they wouldn't probably come to where, where they would go into the Andur Mahal, right? To the inner courtyard. They would not come to the Bahir in courtyard to begin with. That's where the, the only women in the Dalan of Thakur Dalan of these houses were the Baiwalis and the Khemtawalis. So yeah, it's possible Bhutu didn't have to see them in the first place. Thank you, Swati. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Thank you. Anindita Di for your uh, very insightful comments and that you know inspiring discussion. Um, thank you to the audience. A lot of you have joined in from India and needless to say, my heart goes out to all of you and what you've been enduring. And I hope we'll be uh, together soon. We'll be able to meet and this too shall pass. Um, it's quite late in India, so I wouldn't take any more time and uh, it's time to wrap up here. Uh, just about the, fall, the, the forthcoming talk, which is on the 24th of uh, May. Uh, the talk is by Dr. Sanjukta Sundaresan from University of Amsterdam. Uh, she will be speaking on partisan aesthetics, Indian art and 20th century decolonization. The talk will be chaired by Dr. Zehraz Jumaboy from the Courtauld Institute of Art. So do join us um, at 5.30. Uh, this, uh, this talk was a little uh, it was scheduled a little earlier uh, but uh, from the next one onwards we'll resume uh, the sessions at the same time, 5.30 GMT. So do join us and take care of yourself. Stay well. And thank you for joining in tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good night.